When I was a boy growing up in the hills of West Virginia, I spent most of my time in the woods. There was a part of the mountains that just had a very dark feeling when I was there. I could never explain why, but I always felt like something evil was there. In the late fall and on through the winter, we would hear screams that sometimes would sound like a woman, but with a great amount of volume. Sometimes they sounded more like growls and howls. It would scare us children senseless. My dad would just tell us to stay inside or close to the house. Everyone just called it the white thing, but I didn't know why since I had not seen it. We always had a special place where we would make a sled run out of one of the old strip mine roads. We would make a large fire at the top and ride our sleds on the road for almost half a mile, then trudge back up to the fire. On this night, a couple of us stayed later than the rest of the kids. There were three teenage boys and two teenage girls and me. I was ten and one of the girls was my sister. We made a few more rides and decided to just let the fire burn out and go home. We walked down the hill instead of riding because we were all talking. When we got up to about 125 yards down the hill, we heard the scream. Every hair on my head stood straight up, and I had chill bumps all over. The scream came from up at the fire. When we turned around, there it stood, just to the right of the fire. I still can't say how tall it was, but it was a huge animal, and it was white. It had one of those deafening growl screams, and one of the girls fainted. The two other boys picked her up and we started running on down the hill. I'm sure the glow of the fire made it look bigger, but it was the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. When we got home, my dad was standing out on the back porch and said, Did y'all hear that thing scream? And we said yes. Then we told him that we saw it. He told us we could not go up there anymore after dark, but he didn't have to convince me. I didn't have any intentions of going back after dark. One of my school friend's dad shot at it and swears he hit it three times with a twenty-two, but it never even flinched. I still hunt and enjoy the woods, and I really hope I have the opportunity to see another one in my lifetime. My grandfather told me this story back in 1991, a few years before he passed, and so it goes. My grandfather worked from the late 1950s to the early 70s as a landscaper on the Duke Estate in Somerset, New Jersey. When he told the story to my sister and me, he was foggy when giving the exact dates, but he was still very sharp and explained it with incredible detail. My grandfather's job was to manicure and care for the lawns in the north section of the property and other various duties. He said that in the summer of 1972, one August afternoon, he was told by the head groundskeeper that he would be working overtime and that he was needed because the shipment was being delivered from Wisconsin. They needed about eight men to unload a crate and bring it into the garden area. That night, the truck arrived and was getting late. The men who were asked to stay overtime were eager to get things done and over with and be on their way. When the truck pulled up, my grandfather said that the crate was about eight feet tall and five feet wide. When he asked what was inside, the one in charge said that they were exotic trees. What happened next was enough to make half of the team get up and walk off the job and not care about the consequences. When the men started pushing the crate off the flatbed truck, A blood-curdling scream was unleashed from within the box. All of the men let go of their grip and the crate fell to the floor. As everyone jumped back, realizing that this was anything but a tree, the head keeper did all he could to save the content's real identity and said that it was a black bear inside of it. While the men were regaining their composure, most of the help walked off the job. They said they didn't want to get hurt or mauled dealing with a wild animal without the proper safety equipment, So off they went, including my grandfather. Only two men stayed to finish what they were asked. This is what was told to my grandfather. The two remaining men had managed to get the load onto a dolly and then dragged it into the garden compound. While guiding the crate down the maid path, balance was lost and the crate came off the wheels. The crate hit hard enough to crack the side of the crate and loosen the side panel which fell off and exposed the contents. What the two remaining men witnessed that night was enough to make them seek employment elsewhere. What I'm telling you was how it was told to me. Inside the crate sat a creature that had the shape of a man, but was anything but a man. They couldn't give a height measurement since the creature was in a sitting position, but they said it was huge. It had the shape of a man with a very large frame, only it was covered with black hair. The creature was strapped down and had shackles on his legs and feet and arms. The face didn't look like a man, but had some human features. The workers said it looked more like a monkey or a gorilla. The hair was extremely long and dirty. 
At one point, one of the men said they thought that this thing was trying to speak or communicate with words, but all it did was kept on drooling. They were under the impression that this creature was heavily sedated because it couldn't keep his head up straight. It rested its head on its chest. A couple of inches away from the creature's head was an empty water bottle nailed to the wall. On the other side of the creature was an ivy stand connected to the wall and stuck into its arm. It might have been used to feed this creature during its transport. One of the oddest parts of the story was that my grandfather was told that this creature was sitting in a rocking chair. I could never understand this. But after thinking about it, though, I think it was maybe to prevent this thing from getting cramps during the move. They also said that the odor was overpowering and enough to make anyone pass out. The combined smells of urine, waste, and body odor was rank. My grandfather stuck by this story until the very end. About two weeks before he passed away, my sister reminded me to bring it up again and confront him, which I did. There is no need to go over the story again because we both knew how it went. I just asked him, Papa, remember the crate you had to move in Jersey? He just looked at me, smiled, and said, Of course. I said, Did you embellish it at all? He said, No, there was no reason to. It happened the way I said it happened. I said, Because now would be the time to tell me. He looked at me and said, You want to know if I embellished the story? The truth is that I am guilty of the opposite. There was so much that I left out. The story was just the beginning. Remember something. I worked there for two more years after that. There are things that a young mind should not hear. I said, but I'm not a child anymore. I am sure I can handle what it is that you have to say. Grandfather said, tomorrow I will finish the story. Come back tomorrow. But there was no tomorrow. Grandfather passed away at 2 a.m. that morning in a New York hospital. I'm a tribal member of the Ute tribe located in northeastern Utah, below the Wyoming, and west of the Colorado border. I've heard many stories of Sasquatch. In my language, we call it Siach, in the Ute language. My grandfather used to tell me stories of this creature. It is said to be an aggressive and elusive creature, also known to be a child snatcher. He also said that there are two kinds of them. One is black said to be somewhat of an omnivore, eating both meat and vegetation, and not as aggressive. There's a brown one, said to be very aggressive, and is a carnivore, and eats humans as well. Many sightings have occurred in different locations here on the reservation. Northeastern Utah, 1985, my first encounter with what I believe to be a group of three Bigfoot was when I was about eight years old. I was spending the night at my aunt's home, my older sister and five other cousins planned to sleep outside in tents in the backyard. My sister and the girls slept in one tent, while my male cousin and I slept in the other. Our tent was positioned on the west side of the property line. My aunt's neighbor had a garden of corn, squash, and some other stuff next to us on the other side of the fence. At the time, the small community didn't have street lights, so at night, most of the area was pitch black except for a yard light in a distance. As soon as it got dark, we all decided to go to sleep. Sometime during the night, I was awakened by a loud booming sound. East of the community, there used to be large metal dumpsters. I figured it had to be those dumpsters that got slammed. The neighborhood dogs were going nuts. It sounded like they were attacking something. My cousins were all deeply asleep, so I lay in the tent listening for a while. The dogs began following these things up the street. I could tell they were coming closer because they made a strange sound like a deep huffing, groaning sound as if they had ran from somewhere far away. I began to get scared. I didn't understand why the others did not hear these beasts. I lay inside the tent, stiff as a board, listening to these things move around. They seemed to be communicating by broken language or it sounded like something talking backward. The dogs continued to make attacks on these things. They were fighting back with the dogs. At times, I would hear a dog get kicked because they would let out a yelp and cry. These things were getting pissed off because the neighborhood dogs would not leave them alone. Eventually, they left back into the nearby fields, so I thought. The night was not over yet. I got relaxed after the encounter, and I fell back to sleep. 
Then again, I was wakened by the heavy footsteps coming and the terrifying sounds of grunting and groaning. The dogs began to bark and attack them again. One of them must have gotten bit real good because it let out this terrible scream. I heard a loud crack and the dog let out a scream and ran away yelping. They crossed the chain link fence into the garden. I could hear them chewing on the vegetables. It was a long, terrifying night. I prayed these things would not bother us in the tents. What made me believe these things were Bigfoot is that I saw the shadow off a nearby yard light as it walked past our tent. It was walking on two legs upright, and I could see its head and shoulders, and it appeared to have a human-like figure. Finally, as daybreak came, one of them oinked and grunted. They gathered and ran off northbound toward the river bottom with the dogs tailing them. I was in complete shock that day. I told my uncle and aunt about the whole thing, and they believed me as well as did my cousins. It all started on June 24, 2007. I was in Juniata County, Pennsylvania, only a few miles from the Snyder County border and Bald Eagle State Park. I live about 95 miles away from the cabin. At the time, I was only a teenager who hadn't gotten my driver's license at the time. There was a creek right next to the cabin. I decided to walk upstream that day at about 12.30 to 1 p.m. About 50 feet upstream is a small handmade dam of rocks. There are evergreen trees along the cabin side of the bank. I got there and got a weird feeling like I was being watched. I looked over across the creek, in between me and the cabin. I saw a mother Sasquatch holding a very young Sasquatch in one arm. I was totally mesmerized, then I got another feeling of being watched. I looked more upstream, and there he was, the alpha male of the territory. Looked kind of like the one in the Patterson-Gimlin film, but had black fur and no sagittal crest on its head. Its head was box-like and small for its body. It had a thick brow line that made his piercing eyes look sunken in. That's what got me, the eyes. Those half-human, half-gorilla-like eyes pierced right through me. If looks could kill, I would have been in a casket seven feet under. They were a copperish red with orange streaks. I rarely ever go to the cabin in winter, mostly early spring to mid or late fall. When it's warm out, I spend time in the creek to cool off. This one time when I was about 17, I was in the creek near where I had my first encounter. I just happened to look upstream, and there was the same big one I saw right across the creek from me. This time he was sitting on a rock along the bank. He was just sitting there observing me. It's like over time they realized I meant no harm. The last time I went there last year, I was sitting in the kitchen of the cabin listening to music at about 9 p.m. Out of nowhere, I heard a loud thud along the wall. Whatever it was shook the whole cabin. I immediately turned off the music and sat completely still. Then I heard a voice outside the cabin. It was in a language I couldn't understand. I have heard of samurai chatter, Bigfoot language, so to speak. I still have no idea what it wanted, but it spoke to me and left. I will be making regular trips to the cabin soon, and I will let you know of any more encounters. 1982, Squawk Mountain, Washington State. My dad and I went grouse hunting one fall day in the afternoon. We had walked a few miles inward using an old mining road. The day was very clear out, and the sun was casting a nice warm glow on the forest floor. Visibility was 100%. We didn't see any signs of grouse, so we decided to get off the trail and use a well-used game trail that was very narrow, but easy to walk on. We proceeded on this trail for well over a mile when the trail began to go downhill into a very dark gully between two mountains. It progressively was getting darker as we proceeded to move downhill and seemed to have an ominous feeling to it. We walked down the trail moving slowly, listening, and observing for signs of game birds. I barely noticed there was a long wall of dirt that was about six feet high and seemed to parallel the game trail we walked on. Suddenly. We both heard heavy footsteps coming from behind us, moving in the direction we were walking. As the sound of footsteps grew louder, we noticed it wasn't walking directly behind us, but just on the other side of the dirt mound that paralleled our trail. The sound was very heavy and clearly bipedal as the debris on the forest floor crunched beneath every footstep. We both quickly squatted down and waited for whatever it was to go by or possibly come over the dirt mound at us. My dad readied with his shotgun and whispered, I think it's a bear. But it was then we both noticed that whatever it was, was walking 
and also breaking very high branches at the bottom of the trees, which were at least seven to eight feet off the ground. Whatever it was, was tall enough to brush against the bottom branches of the pines, and we both looked at each other with a what-the-hell look on our faces. Because of lack of sunlight, the bottom branches of pine trees fall off and die, and only grow higher off the ground. Suddenly, when the creature was only a few feet from us on the other side of the dirt mound, it stopped. We didn't move a muscle, and I was holding my breath trying to listen and not be noticed. The creature was standing totally still, and we could hear it sniffing the air slowly. It knew that we were there, but wasn't sure where. Then it began to slowly walk down into the gully again, but hooked around and back up, this time on the game trail. Suddenly, we saw it emerge from the trees only about 30 yards from us. It was still looking around, slowly scanning for us, as we just squatted there on the trail. Then it quickly stopped and gasped as it noticed us. Its mouth opened, and it had this surprised look on its face. I was so scared, I remember I couldn't feel my legs, and my body had so much adrenaline running through it, my skin was tingling, my mouth was dry, and my tongue was numb. I just could not believe what we were seeing. It just stood there looking at us like he was in disbelief also. I remember looking at this thing's every detail and being in awe of the massive size and muscular build of this creature. It made the Patterson Bigfoot look like a couch potato as this creature was incredibly well built. Every muscle was defined and overly developed, just like a bodybuilder. Even with its immense size, it had this powerful, fast look to it, like it was built to burst out into a fast sprint. It did not look slow at all, and if he wanted to get us, he easily could have. After about three to five minutes of staring at each other, he slowly backed up, not taking his eyes off us, until it disappeared into the woods. Not saying anything, my dad motioned for me to get up and walk back. We both quickly walked back up the hill as fast as we could walk. We never said one word as we walked back to the truck. In fact, once in the truck and on the road, we never said anything at all. It was like we were both in shock at what we had just seen. I wanted to share an encounter with you that was pretty significant for me and my family. The encounter happened to my father, but he has refused to ever talk about it again and oftentimes pretends it never happened. Let me give you some background. My dad's family grew up in the back country of Kentucky, and he was raised in a very blue-collar suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio. He was raised to have a very strong work ethic, honesty, integrity, and family values. He's been an elder at our church for 30 years. I say this because my dad has never lied or misled any of us, and has strong convictions about his word. When I was a senior in high school, we lived on a fairly busy road, however there were patches of woods all around us. It's a typical suburb of the city of Cincinnati. We were living in a small white house next to about three acres of thick woods that was owned by the Cincinnati Nature Society, so it was relatively untouched and protected. Our driveway was about 40 yards long and dead-ended into a small hill about seven feet high. The woods ran all the way up the side of our driveway and beyond and was about three feet off to the right. We always parked our cars next to each other at the end of the driveway, so one car was always about five feet from the wood line. Our back door was actually on the side of the house facing the woods, and our yard was fairly large and very dark, so we had a floodlight above the door. Outside the door was a small concrete path that went to a set of concrete stairs that led down the hill and to the driveway, where we parked. Now the encounter. My dad would leave for work every morning at 4.30 a.m. My mom would always get up and walk him to the door to see him off to work. This particular morning, he walked out the door and started down the concrete path towards the stairs. He got about 20 feet away from the house, near the top of the stairs, when he stopped dead in his tracks. He stood there motionless for about 10 seconds. My mum, curious and thinking maybe he forgot something, opened the door and asked him what was wrong. He took a step back and stopped again. He said to my mum in a low voice, Carol, shut the door and go get my gun. She was confused and he took another step back and said again, shut the door and go get my gun. He had a 12-gauge Remington shotgun he kept in his bedroom. He slowly walked backwards until he got to the side door and lunged inside, locking the door, grabbed his gun, and sat in our living room by our windows, which faced the woods, for the rest of the morning. He didn't wake us up for school, and he wouldn't let us go outside all day. I've never seen my dad scared. I've never seen him show any fear at all, 
He's very steady under pressure. This morning was the first time I ever saw my dad truly terrified. He was drained of color and wouldn't talk to any of us except to say how he saw something outside and didn't want us going out. My mom kept asking him what happened and he wouldn't say anything. Finally, they went into their bedroom to talk, and naturally, I listened outside. He told my mom that as he got to the top of the steps, he happened to look at our minivan which was parked by the woods. He saw something through the windows staring at him, watching him as he walked down the walkway. He stopped thinking it was a man, possibly a burglar. Suddenly he realized that it wasn't a man because it was covered with hair, but had the face of a man in a lot of ways. He stopped and stared as this creature watched him. He was terrified, almost too terrified to move until he heard my mom open the door. Suddenly the creature stood up. It was easily three feet taller than our van, making it about eight feet tall, and stared at him, rolling its lips and baring its teeth in anger. My dad took a step back, and it took a step towards him. Every time he took a step back, the creature took a threatening step towards him. Finally, it turned, staring him down, and walked slowly into the woods. As he was telling my mum, he could barely get the words out, and he finally said, Bigfoot. My mum finally came out of her room, and she was clearly shaken up after seeing my dad so afraid. This was a huge deal, because he doesn't believe in anything like this, and still won't admit to it. It's almost like his entire world view would have to change if he admitted that there are things there he doesn't understand. I can remember asking my mum, did Dad see a Bigfoot? And the look on her face was complete terror and confusion, and she said, your dad saw a Bigfoot. We weren't allowed outside for almost a month, except to go to school. To this day, he won't talk about it. Has a Sasquatch ever migrated through or traveled through a more populated area on its way to a more dense and wooded area? There are a number of small patches of woods in our area, and it would be possible to travel through to get to a real empty area. Just wanted to share. Thanks for listening.